The Bible has all kinds of stories in it, and some of those stories are PG-13. Now, the story that we're going through today in Genesis chapter 38 is one of those stories. It deals with themes of abuse and sexual objectification, but yet has an incredible turning point and point of forgiveness for this family that we've been following the past couple of Sabbaths. I, I hope that you will find in it something meaningful for you and your story and the story of the people that are close to you. So with that said, let's begin. We are in the middle of a, the series on the life story of Joseph. And, you know, we've been going through the life stories of many other people in connection with him. Uh, we've talked about his father, Jacob. We've talked about his, his, uh, and his whole life and how his broken relationships and, and way of handling life uh, fed down into his, into his son's relationships. Uh, we've looked at the, one of his brothers and we've looked at how he's, he's been, um, how he might have perceived Joseph when they were growing up. And then we looked at, uh, and now we're looking at Joseph uh, from another perspective from one of his brothers. Now the Bible actually in chapter 38 of Genesis, it, it starts talking, it can, stops, it pauses the story of Joseph and it moves to the story of Judah for an entire chapter. And some uh, Bible commentary uh, authors, they say, well, this was just a, a piece of information that they didn't know where to put it, so they stuck it here. I disagree with that, and I think as we investigate this story together, you'll find that it's very intentional, that it's actually beautifully placed, and that you might see yourself in some aspect of the story of Judah, um, and I'm looking forward to exploring it with you. Let's pray. God, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for these these incredible stories and thank you for the the lives that are depicted in it people that have have been from all different backgrounds and situations and experiences and they they intersect with you uh, sometimes by name and sometimes not and we're excited for this please guide our minds and help us to see ourselves in these pages i ask these things in jesus's name amen let's get into it so we've got this story beginning in Genesis chapter 38, and it begins like this. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Now, just to stop right there, right at the beginning, it's already so juicy because we see here that Judah, he, he left, he left his brothers. And you, you kind of wonder, well, why would Judah leave his brothers? Well, uh, we do get an insight into Judah. He is highlighted in the previous chapter, in chapter 37, uh, in, in verse 26, it says, so Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and uh, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh after all. Judah, he, he, he's interested in profit. And you think about these, these 12 brothers being lumped together, uh, the oldest is the one that's going to get the, the lion's share of the inheritance. And what's Judah going to get? So Judah probably thinks, you know, my brothers are going to take all of the wealth from my father when he passes. I, I've got to go make it in the world. I have to go do something for myself instead of just, just focusing on, on what my father needs. And so he, he thinks profit, profit. There's no profit here. He, we also have an insight from the previous chapter that that his father, Jacob, was, was weeping constantly, perpetually, could not be consoled from the loss of his, of his second to the last son, uh, Joseph. And so his father was always weeping around the tent, was just, just 
depressing. He probably didn't want to be around that. And, and so he, he thought, ah, what am, I, what am I here for? I'm not going to get anything. My dad's always crying. And, and then there, his brothers were resentful of their actions. They started to regret the decision that they made because they, they hadn't thought it through. And, and the, the consequence of, of losing a brother is, is sadness for your, for your father and for yourselves and the regret that was in that family. So it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. He left, he left his brothers. And he, he visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Um, one of the commentators when I was doing research for this, this sermon was that, that Hira was probably somebody that Judah had met a long time before. And that said that he had built a friendship up with this, this person from, from the, the area around him. And so, the, the, but Hira was not in the line from Abraham and did not it, perceivably uh, honor God, uh, the God of Judah's fathers. And so this was not a church friend. This was a, this was a wingman. <laughs> and so Judah, he, he, he connects with, with his friend Hira um, in verse 2. Is this still in verse 1? And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. Uh, Shua, it, it, the way it's worded, it could mean that that's her name. But it also could mean that's just the name of her father. And so Shua's daughter. And uh, so we don't really know her name for certain. But... Uh, he found this woman, this Canaanite girl, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Cherizib, at Chezib, I'm sorry, where, uh, when, she w when she bore him. So she has Ur. She has Onan and she has Shelah. Shelah. Um, and we have this, we have that Judah, he leaves first. He leaves and separates from his legacy, his family support. He leaves it. And he befriends Hira, separates from his family's influence. And then he marries Shua's daughter and separates from his family heritage. And, and all the way along, he just keeps building these separations. He's cutting people off and their influences from his life. And he's gravitating towards these other ways of, of life and living that are, are from a, a, another place, another, another space. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the prodigal son. That Judah, in some way, is, it has that same mentality. He wants to go away. There's no profit here. What am I going to gain? And so he just leaves. He leaves. Um, and you know, his, his father, for different reasons, he also left. He left his father's house. And, and he went off to make his fortune. So I, I think there's this, this repeating story. Different, different people, different details. Same story. Verse 6. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. And her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. <laughs> we don't know what kind of wicked. Uh, we just know that this, the narrator said, and he was wicked, and God killed him, period. That's all we know about him. And so now you've got this situation of this oldest brother of Judah, uh, oldest son of Judah, who married a woman, but right before they could actually have children, he dies. Now Tamar is a widow, and what's going to happen? What's going what's gonna to come from this? Well, in those days, if there was a widow, she needed, to have, she needed to have children so that way they could take care of her when she's older. Uh, they didn't have social security. They needed the support of the family system. And so, because Judah did not have a child from her from her husband, who was then deceased, 
then the, the law of the land in those days was that the second son would then marry her and would give her a child in his brother's name, his older brother's name. But it says specifically that Onan, Onan didn't want to have a child for his brother. And it wasn't because it was a little weird or something. This was common stuff that they did back then. It, it was because for some reason he, he had spite towards his older brother. There was a complete lack of affection for his brother or his brother's name. And so he doesn't even want to do the basic um, honor of giving his, his brother a son. Uh, to carry on his name, to carry on his legacy, to take care of his widow. It, it just, it's a very uh, troubling thing, but he's willing to be satisfied himself from that experience, but he's not willing to give her what she needs and, uh, and what, what she deserves uh, by, this, by this relationship and family uh, contract. So, <laughs> so God, uh, it says, and the thing which he did, verse 10, displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Now, you're, imagine Judah, his first son dies after he marries this woman, Tamar. And then he, his second son dies after he marries her. And so he thinks, what am I going to do? And it's sad when you see the mentality that is driving Judah. He's, he, he looks at this situation and instead of, instead of seeing that his sons were evil, that their death was just, that their characters were so corrupt and so destructive that God destroyed them. And instead of seeing that, he goes, nah, it can't be their fault. It must be the woman. It must be that woman. It must be Tamar. And so he says to her, but instead of saying that exactly, he just kind of keeps it in his head. Verse 11, then Judah said to Tamar, um, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, lest he... Uh, for he said, like in his own mind, lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. You know, uh, it was, it's interesting that Judah was very, he had inherited his father's ability to work a situation out to his own benefit or to the way that he wants it to go. Uh, he can't control everything, but he's going to try. And so when he sees this, this situation, he goes, oh, Tamar, you know, if you just go, you be a widow in your father's house, you know, go, pretend as though there's no one to support you, is essentially what he's saying. So go back to your father's house, be a widow there. When, when my youngest son is older, I'll, I'll give him to you. Uh, that's what I'll do. But you, ju you just wait. You just wait for me to do something about it. How sad, how... how wrong is this situation. Now in the process of time, verse 12, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend uh, Hira, the Adulamite. So his wife dies. He comes hoping to seek gain and instead everyone dies around him. He, his, his first son, then his second son, then his wife. And he's, you know, he's, he grieves, he mourns, and he's comforted. And then he goes up to the festivities of sheep shearing um, that his, his, conceivably that it's, it's, it's his servants that are doing this work up in Timnah, this uh, hill country uh, that's not too far away. So he goes up there for this he goes up there for this uh, ceremony. Now it says, verse 13, And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow, she, quick thinker, took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, 
and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. Whoa. Tamar realizes that she's not going to be treated with equity. She realizes that Judah is just as bad as his oldest son that she was married to, and just as bad as his second son that he is not going to be giving her what she needs in order to survive that is rightfully hers. And so she, she goes to take it. She takes off her widow garments. You can imagine what that must have looked like, you know, something that, that designates to people in a crowd that this person is a widow. Um, maybe it's a, a garment of mourning. Maybe it's something that's, that's of, of black colors. Maybe it's, um, uh, maybe it's something that looks very very uh, clothing of weeping and maybe it has a something that's ripped that shows like there's a lot of distress in the person's life and she's been living this way wearing these clothes feeling this way for for quite a few years to where hey this is a little too long this is longer than they should be and then she hears that her father-in-law is is going off to this place and so she t she takes off these clothes puts on this veil over her face. She wraps herself in, in some sort of clothing and, and then she goes and sits in this place that's along the roadside towards where she knows that he'll be walking along. And there's a lot going on in her mind that isn't specifically said, that's very obvious to this story. Somehow she knows, one, that he's going to be going through that way and that's, that's maybe logic. Two, she knows how to get him to respond to her. She knows she's been around him long enough to understand what, what he wants, what kind of uh, mentality he'll be in, and what he's going to respond to. And so she, she dresses like this. Um, the word here is, is harlot. Later on, he uses a different word. I'll get to that in a second. And she puts on this covering over her face, and it says because she was, uh, she, uh, to dress, so that way she, he would think that she's a harlot by putting a veil over her face. That's different than I think the way we, we view it today. Uh, today, we think that somebody that's revealing, someone that takes, takes off some articles of clothing they would be considered uh, promiscuous. But this person, in those days, you put a veil over your face because anonymity, the, the lack of I identity is what attracts someone. That, that being, um, in that kind of relationship, it, uh, being in that kind of connection with somebody that is, is a stranger, it's preferable if you don't, your humanity, your uniqueness is not being displayed. Just, it's that, that's actually being covered. That you can be then used as an object, easier, better, um, it's a, it's, it says a lot. It says a lot. That little detail says a lot. And I think when we read through it, we go, huh? And we keep going. It's, it's making a profound statement that keeps building this argument for the character of Judah all the way through this story. And I'll get to it in a second. Then he turned to her by the way, by the wayside and said, please let me come into you. Let me, let me come. Uh, in those days, they said it was kind of like, um, get, can we get private? And, uh, for he did not know what, that she was his daughter-in-law. I want to make some observations here. The word that's used for harlot, uh, later on in the story that, that he himself uses and his best BFF set uses is a word that's very um, traditional. It, it doesn't 
have the same connection with the English word that we use today. In fact, it had a reference to uh, somebody that worked in a temple, uh, not for the Most High God, but for uh, these little deities that they would serve. And one way they would do this is through um, using their body and using other people's bodies in, in, a, in some sort of thing that they called worship. And so this connection uh, was was a something they would sell and so that this this temple prostitute uh, but instead of using that word they were using this word that is very similar to the word wife and <laughs> that this this concept of wife isn't even like a rent to own so to speak thing it's 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 atrocious, but it was commonplace that these people, these, these women and these men were referred to with this term of wife, not saying in any sort of relationship. It was just like for, for the moment. And it was a very sad, pathetic uh, way of, of demeaning somebody into an object. It just, it, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with this these details here. Um, and, the, and this fact that Judah would use that word later on, along with his best friend, for this woman, this anonymous woman, and the fact that his own wife's name is not mentioned, just the daughter of Shua, and that for Judah, it just seems like constantly throughout his life, throughout all the choices that he makes, everything, including what is supposed to be love, is a transaction. Everything for Judah is a transaction. That's just what it is. Life is a transaction, one big transaction. And I, I see when I look at his life and his father's life that, that there is this, this history of this, well, what are you gonna give me? Or I'm gonna give you this much just so I can get this much. And, and that's the way he lives his life. That's the way he interacts with everybody in his life, including his own wife. Including even, when you look into it, his friend, his best friend. So it continues. So she said, what will you give me? And verse 17, and he said, I will send you a, a young goat from the flock. And so she said, uh, Will you give me a pledge till you send it? You know, she's being, she knows what she's doing. And verse 18, then he says, oh, well, what pledge shall I give you? And so she says, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. <laughs> this, this little banter and all of a sudden she knows exactly what she wants. And she says, your signet, which is your seal, the thing that you, you, mark your transactions with, the thing that has your name engraved on it, the thing that will be pressed into this wax or into this clay to designate that you have a approved this decision or something. And the cord is the thing that would, would hang it around your neck and to keep it close to you because that thing's precious. That thing is like a credit card, but with your name, with your reputation attached. And then your staff is the thing that you lean on, the thing that you do work by. It's a thing that holds you up. It's a thing that helps you go forward in life. And so she says, I want your reputation and I want your, your support. Which is what, she's a daughter-in-law. Isn't that what she deserves? Isn't that what he should have been giving her all the way along? So she asked for these things. So she said, your signet ring, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave her to the, gave them to her and went to her and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. Verse 20, and Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand but he did not find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, uh, where is the harlot, the, the wife, the, the temporary wife, who was 
openly by the roadside. And they said, uh, there was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. Also, the men of the place said that there wasn't anyone like that in this place. Verse 23, then Judah said, uh, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. I don't know why he said we, because <laughs> Hira has nothing to blame on there. Um, for I sent this young goat and you have not found her. What is so sad here, it's just a t tragic story, that Judah is worried about his own shame, his own embarrassment. He's worried about his own embarrassment and apparently that, that of his, his best friend who goes to solve this for him. He's worried about his own, his own shame, but he cares nothing for his daughter-in-law. He doesn't care about the shame and the feelings of guilt and the, and the lack of future that he has condemned her to. But oh, I don't want to be embarrassed. Verse 24, and it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. Ooh, shady. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Now Judah, he was pretty enraged, I'm sure. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was pretty upset because this woman would do such a thing that is somehow connected to him, that would bring down his reputation, his pristine reputation. But I think also in this spot, he also saw an opportunity. He owed her his youngest son, but he refused it. And well, well hey, now she deserves it. <laughs> now I can get rid of her. I can solve this problem that I have in my, in my life and in my hands. Ah. Bring her out and let her be burned. Verse 25. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. Oh, <laughs> this is just like the previous chapter in verses 23, uh, 32 and 33 that Joseph, when his coat was ripped off of him and Judah and his brothers, they sent to their father the coat and said, could you determine, can you determine whose coat this is? Examine it for yourself and see if this might be your son's. And now she sends the, the signet and the staff and sends it to him. And he goes, she says, she sees the same terminology. Will you determine if this is, whose this is, oh, man. So Judah, verse 26, so Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her Sheila, my son, and he never knew her again. In this action by Tamar, Judah finally realizes his own sin. That, the, that, the, that he himself was worse than the one that he judged. That he himself was, was at fault for the worst atrocity against this woman. That he finally realized how he's been treating her and how he's probably been living his whole life. And it all hits him in this moment. This is the first moment in his, in his story, where he realizes what he's gotten himself into, that he's nailed himself to the wall with his own actions, and the consequences of his own decisions have backed him into that corner. And suddenly now he's, he's stuck, but he sees it. He doesn't try and get out of it. He doesn't try and, and oh, 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 which is his nature, which is how he's practiced living his whole life. And instead he, he, he accepts it. And he gives to her the acknowledgement that she is more righteous than himself. That he, had, he has no business putting any, that, that he just judges himself straight there, right there in that moment. And, and the question remains, how can, 
how did the how did this brother who had conceived of such a plan as to sell his own brother, his own blood, to sell his own blood to, to some slave drivers, that how could this how could this one that had such a a warped, selfish, manipulating mind end up becoming the what the brother that would approach Joseph like he will later on in the story, no spoilers. And, and be the one that is actually in the line of, of King David and also of the promised one that has been promised from the beginning of this book. All the way, and how could this man be there? It's because of this moment. Not because he did some grandiose thing. It was simply, he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged the way he had been living his life. And, and he stopped using others and began raising others up. He became compassionate to the needs of others around him. He became responsible for the feelings of his father and the care, became a caretaker for his brothers. And he became a new man, a new leader for his family and his family line. That his name, Judah, did not mean the, the conniving, manipulating, uh, opportunistic, person that he was his name then meant in was in connection with with god's line and his blessing it's amazing it's beautiful and so when from this very messed up situation this is actually the first tiny turning point huge of course but tiny turning point in this family story all the way down has been this perpetual, uh, undeniable, unstoppable crash. Uh, the destruction that is, is promised for this family by their own decisions, by their own actions, by their own perpetuation is death. And here there is a turning. His, his sons, Tamar, was with with uh, twins she had twins and her second uh it's kind of interesting what happened the the midwife when she's there to deliver the children uh, the the child uh a hand is comes out first and so she goes oh this one was born first and she takes a scarlet thread she was all prepared and she wraps it around his little arm ties it and but then his arm comes back in and then another baby comes out without. And then the, the one that stuck his hand out came out first, uh, second. And, and she, she, um, they were named separately, but the second one, uh, well, the one that was technically came out first, completely, named him Perez. And it said, the, this breach be upon you, is the, the New King James, but the... It's kind of like saying, you really know how to push your way to the front. And doesn't that encapsulate Judah and Tamar and this whole family line? They just try and push themselves to the front. Sarah, uh, Rebecca, and, and all the way back. And um, uh, Rachel and Leah and all the way back. Like they, they push themselves to the front. And so this child is in that line, but this son... He, he also continues on this family legacy. And I think it's interesting that, and the theologians point this out, that the second one is usually the one that God favors and blesses. And God really likes the underdog. So if you're the oldest like me, God loves you too. But there's, there's this narrative construct that just keeps, keeps pointing out. Um, and then, so where is the... This is beautiful what God is doing in this family story, and we're just in the middle of it. But one detail that I thought was just beautiful, and I want to end on this, that that, that country, that hill country of Timnah, where Judah was, was shear, going to shear his sheep, I don't know if this is poetic justice necessarily, but I think I'd rather call it poetic grace, that that hill country, once... Israel came into the promised land to settle there. Timnah was given to the line of Judah. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for what you're doing in our stories. Way back then and today, we will trust you, we'll follow you, and we will turn. Show us where we're at. Show us what we need to repent from and the way that we treat the people around us. May we turn because you will forgive and we'll trust you in that. I ask these things in Jesus' name. On behalf of our incredible church, amen. Amen.